A bionic cyborg, part human, part machine. Stronger, smarter, more adaptable to its environment. Miniature computer-controlled robots that cruise through the bloodstream, locating and killing diseased cells. Three-dimensional images, so real, they can allow us to see the results of reconstructive surgery before it happens. The cyborg, neither man nor machine, but a hybrid of both, a new species for the distant future. But there are those who believe that cyborgs already live among us, that the line between the natural and the artificial is fading. Every time we get in our cars, log onto the internet, even wear eyeglasses, we merge with machines, and they with us. Well, we already have cyborgs here today. They're very simple ones. They have in cardiac pacemakers, they have artificial hips, uh, they have uh, diaphragmatic pacers, uh, some of them have artificial prostheses. Uh, so at this point in time, uh, we are very, very early in the exploration of being able to do uh, cyborg manufacturing, if you will. One man who certainly fits this definition of cyborg is Larry Bowden. As a successful architectural designer, he depends on his computer for his livelihood. But that's not what makes him a kind of modern day bionic man. Larry Bowden is also a high level quadriplegic, paralyzed from the neck down after a terrible car accident. You face a million barriers when you have no hand function. I mean, how do you use an elevator when you can't press a button? How do you open a door when the capability is not there? Your options are actually pretty limited. I mean, I mean where do you go? What do you do? The answers to these questions came when Larry met Gary Birch, now executive director of the Neil Squire Foundation, a national organization headquartered in Burnaby, BC. Confined to a wheelchair yep, since he was 17, Gary understood Larry's concerns completely. After I was injured, I started university in electrical engineering. At that time, I knew that I wanted to get involved in the, the development of technology for people with disabilities. And I'd already started to realize that one of the key aspects was the human-machine interface. The merging of man and machine has been a vital relationship in Larry's life since his accident. It has also been an ever-changing one as Gary Birch and his organization looked for ways to control Larry's environment and help him reclaim his independence. The technology has actually gone from very simple things, uh, like simple switches, which are air control operated, and uh, eventually we started to build environmental controls that were voice activated. And then the step after that that we reached was wheelchair mounted environmental controls so that you could actually control something from your wheelchair. What we came up with was a, uh, a computer that ran off of a radio signal with a menu-driven uh, screen that you could control certain things in your own home environment. So by moving my hand slightly, it will activate the device, which lies dormant when it's not being used. And uh, it allows me to scan through a menu which uh, encompasses telephones and uh, lighting systems. Uh, on the, on the televisions, VCRs. The Neil Squire Foundation also brought significant advancements to Larry's career. As an architectural designer, I had to use a mouse stick and it took me forever to draw anything. So uh, we developed a product called a Jouse, which is a combination between a, a joystick and a mouse. It's operated by mouth and by air and coupling it with voice I can run an AutoCAD system at the same speed as an able-bodied person. Now, all of a sudden, I'm as good as any other person from an employer standpoint. It is a vast improvement, but not enough for those constantly looking into the future. 
Gary Birch and his colleagues are still searching for a more ideal, more direct man-to-machine interface. I started to think, well, what, what would be the ideal interface? Well, the ideal interface for someone who is very disabled would be to take signals directly from the brain and map that to uh, controlling the device. The first stage of this research was to just prove the con proof of concept. Can we do this? We have achieved that. We've gone through a couple of phases of that, and we have, within the last couple of years, proven concept. We can do this. Biometric signals inherently have more error than physical devices that we have. So if we can successfully find ways to reduce that error so that our brain switch is very reliable, okay. then we can apply it to specific application, more critical applications. Which is why Larry Bowden is here today at the Foundation's Brain Interface Laboratory. He is about to take the next step in an experiment that could revolutionize medical technology and open doors to the future. An ordinary man about to become a true 21st century cyborg. Uh, the concept of cyborg, is, which is really popular in the current media, is basically you have non-organic material embedded and interfaced directly to the human organic material systems. So there's augmented function. The nylon mesh placed on Larry's head is actually a sophisticated device called an EEG cap. Its metal electrodes are designed to pick up specific electrical brain waves. An electrode gel injected through the holes on the cap serves as a conductor. Larry's brain waves are digitized and fed to a computer that will understand these brain waves and obey certain commands. My method of, of making the switch work is that I mentally yeah, nice and physically way. try and move my finger, which is paralyzed. So by doing that, they can see me uh, physically trying to move something, uh, which is just something that they can measure. It's a measurable response. And I know that by trying to move my finger, I can make something happen on the computer. While Larry's mind interacts directly with the computer, Steve Mason monitors how accurately the computer responds to Larry's brain waves. Once initial testing is complete, Larry moves on to the next phase. He will attempt to navigate a simulated maze using only his brain. The maze is a virtual environment, often seen like in standard video games where you're running through halls. In this case, you'd be wheeling through halls. And as he comes up on different intersections in that we have, he has control over the direction he can go through the maze. When he wants to make a turn in the maze, he will activate that turn by trying to move his finger. Larry's brain signals tell the computer whether he wants to turn left or right the computer obeys with astounding accuracy. The In the next experiment, Larry will use his mind That's to select an environmental control option from a menu. The environmental control system is designed to control uh, appliances like lights, TVs, VCRs, stereos in the environment. So Larry will be watching a little menu system that's built on a Palm PC. It will scan automatically, and Larry, with his switch, will be able to select an item to turn it on, turn it off. There's a pointer or a cursor that moves that along, and when it points at the device that he'd like to control, he will then attempt to move his finger. He can't actually move it, but that's the way he, he will trigger it. Again, Larry Bowden's brain waves successfully interact with the computer with 98% accuracy. We are witnessing the birth of human-machine interface evolution. Arthur C. Clarke was writing about this 25 years ago, and here we are on the cusp of developing it to where it's a functional uh, tool. And to me, that is just the most exciting advance. Gary Birch mm -hmm. is optimistic that 100% reliability is just positive. a few years away. We're one of the few labs in the world that's doing this with scalp-recorded EEG signals. 
The challenge is that sometimes the brain signals are so complicated and there's so much going on, it can fool the switch. We've been able to reduce that to a very low level, and I think we have to still improve that. And what keeps me going is that I see this technology happening, I can, I can see this as being one of the key ways in achieving people with disabilities being able to have much fuller lives. You can imagine that if someone is able to obtain good control with their brain, even though they may be totally physically paralyzed, they may be able to guide a robot very sophisticatedly. Ten years, we'll have electrodes that are actually implanted in the, in the skull. Exoskeletal devices that are placed on a person with paralysis, which are powered to move the limbs around. And you would be in control of those exoskeletal devices by using your brain. In the future, I could leave my house, I could, I could sink the wheelchair lift down in my van, I could uh, get in my van, I could sink my van to lock me down, I could sink left, right, brake, stop, I could actually drive somewhere by myself. The, the sky is the limit. Okay, so let's do an isometric contraction on the biceps. Go ahead and flex. The future that Gary Birch describes will have its roots in research currently being conducted. Dr. Jacob Rosen is a professor of electrical engineering at the University of Washington, and he and his colleagues are already making important inroads in the development of exoskeleton technology. An exoskeleton is a robot that you wear, the same way as you wear a shirt or a cloth. It has links and joints that correspond to your, your arm, your, your bones and joints. An exoskeleton is, is, a, is an active thing. So as you wear it, you expect to control it in, a, in an intuitive way. That intuitive control will come at the neuromuscular level, using the brain's command signals to the human muscle to give similar commands to the exoskeleton. The idea behind human-machine interfaces is to pick the right uh, level in which you, the human, are interacting with machines. And the system will move based on this information. It will move faster when the force is higher and it will move slower when the force is lower. In order to simulate muscle action in the exoskeleton, Dr. Rosen and his team take advantage of the slight delay that occurs between the time that the brain signals a muscle to move and the actual movement. If we put electrodes on the skin, we sense the, the command that the neural signal is sending before the action is taking place. And once we measure the signal at that point, we can and feed this information into a parallel system to predict what your physiological muscle would do. Once we have this prediction, we can feed it to the exoskeleton, and once you, the muscle is contracting, the exoskeleton is moving exactly the same way. Dr. Rosen anticipates that the research they are doing today will have a huge impact in the future. Disabled people, which lack the, the capability of moving objects, just everyday objects, will benefit from that type of interface. There are different people who suffer from um, muscle atrophy, but the brain is still sending neural signals to the muscle to, to contract. The muscle of the disabled people is not strong enough to move their arm, but we use this signal as a command signal to the exoskeleton, and then the exoskeleton is backing the leg of uh, mobility of the disabled person. When can we expect all this to happen? Dr. Rosen believes that a functional prototype is less than five years down the road. It's just a natural step when, when you'll be you know, part of a machine or a machine will be part of you. That's promising news for people like Larry Bowden. The future for me is, is just uh, so bright. 
you know, my life just gets better and better every day. And the, the advent of this technology and the, the development of it just leads me with so much hope for the future. Welcome to a world that has remained largely uncharted until now. It is a world that may hold the key to a technology that will battle disease without invasive surgery or life-threatening side effects. A world so small that the tools of this technology measure only one ten thousandth the width of a single human hair. It could well be the future of medicine and it is known as nanotechnology. The world of nanotechnology includes any technique or tool used to manipulate matter the size of atoms and molecules. When we talk about nanotechnology, it's a little bit like Lego. You take these little blocks and you put them together one at a time and you make something and, and the, the assembly of these blocks that you make has a, a function or a role which is different from the role of any individual block. And that's why we're also excited about it, because we're learning how to put atoms and molecules together in such a way that the assembly of these molecules actually have functions which are unique to themselves and not related to the function of any one atom or molecule in the assembly. Now, when you start putting atoms and molecules together in this way, it turns out that the size of things that you make is on the order of a nanometer or two nanometers. If you take four silicon atoms, silicon being the basis of most of our microtechnologies, four silicon atoms side by side is about a nanometer. So it's a very small thing indeed. And we have tools today that actually let us look and work with matter on the level of atoms and molecules. Nanotechnology already exists in the marketplace in products very familiar to us all. Anyone who golfs and has a graphite shaft in their golf bag has a nanocomposite, and that's a composite of a plastic material mixed with graphite. The titanium oxide powders that are used in sunscreen are already down to the nanometer scale in order to get the properties that are required. It's this kind of small thinking that has medical researchers turning their attention to nanotechnology in the search for more sophisticated, less invasive treatments for disease such as cancer. Cancer patients like Kurt Chernyshenko look forward to advancements in nanotechnology that could one day replace current cancer treatments. Since he was diagnosed with leukemia in 1999, Kurt has endured painful chemotherapy injections that travel through his bloodstream in an attempt to kill the cancer cells in his body. Most of the chemotherapy medications uh, causes somewhat uh, queasy feeling, nausea and vomiting majority of them uh, of our patients lose their hair because of chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is probably uh, reached its limit and it's not going to go any further. For the first nine months I didn't feel like a human being. I was just I felt like it was killing me from the inside out which is what it was doing. The treatments for of chemo felt worse than the leukemia did. It is this sad reality that pushes researchers such as Professor Warren Chan to develop nanotechnologies that would help pinpoint and potentially treat cancer at its earliest stages. Imagine if you had a little system that you can target and it only affects the site that's diseased, doesn't affect anything else. If that's the case, you're not gonna have all the side effects you would normally have associated with chemo, with different kind of drugs available. The little system that Professor Chan is trying to develop revolves around something called a quantum dot. It is the name given to a microscopic device manufactured from semiconductor materials such as silicon that has the ability to conduct electricity. Electrons inside the quantum dot can be controlled to emit colored light when excited with certain energy. The theory is that if these quantum dots were injected into the body and then tracked with the aid of optical technology, their location could be displayed on a computer screen. This is a, a quantum dot solution where we coated the surface of the quantum dots with a polymer that makes it uh, compatible with biology without system. So within this vial, it's probably about one times 29 zero millionth quantum dots in here. When we inject these in the body, we only want to inject about a million particles and then have those uh, particles find its target. 
Professor Chan's goal is to train these dots to hunt down and attach themselves to singular cancer cells, exposing them like tiny searchlights before these cells have the chance to become deadly. If you have a, a, a cancer lump in, in your breast, the doctor can remove uh, X amount, right? But if you have one or two cells that survive, that the doctor doesn't remove completely, those cells can grow and become cancerous. Now imagine if you had these quantum dots and had these molecules target those cells, and these quantum dots light up, and if they can see a couple of residual spots in certain areas, they can use a laser to go in and kill those last two or three cells. So it makes the, the surgery process a lot cleaner. Because if you look at, at every kind of disease going from SARS to AIDS to cancer, it's all based on a molecular setting. So we need to find out what are the difference between, let's say, a, a cell that's infected with SARS versus a cell that's infected with AIDS. Then what we need to do is now hook it up to something that will allow us to see those molecules, and that's where quantum dots come into place. Anything that helps, anything that doesn't make you go through the pain that I had to go through is a, a, is a plus, is a bonus. I would certainly try a different approach to it. If it's going to solve my problems, why not send it in? What we're really looking at are approaches that would allow us to, to look for small amounts of either proteins or small molecules that could be in, for example, your bloodstream that would give an indication of the onset of a disease uh, well before um, you actually may even show symptoms. And that really is one of, the, one of the exciting promises for the next couple of decades, is to develop something which many people are starting to call personalized health care. The development of personalized health care may also involve another form of nanotechnology that one day could work hand in hand with developments in quantum dot theory. I think maybe the, uh, the scalpel and all those tools will slowly disappear to make room for different technology uh, that will be uh, more and more under computer control. In the not-so-distant future, a cancer patient comes to her doctor for treatment. But instead of using scalpels or debilitating chemotherapy, the doctor offers his patient a treatment developed specifically for her own genetic makeup. Welcome to the age of nanotechnology. Each of us is genetically is very similar, and yet those differences result in the differences in the way we look, and behave, but also differences in the way that we metabolize drugs. So the idea that we can go to our doctor's office, have a quick screen of our genes that would then be used to determine which drugs to use or which therapies to actually undergo is something that is really going to be revolutionary. The future will also see medication engineered at a molecular level so that it will treat only diseased cells or tissue and leave the rest of the body alone, eliminating harmful side effects. These drugs have an, have an effect in other parts of your body other than where they're intended. But what we're seeing now is evidence that we will be able to generate little capsules for drugs that go into your bloodstream and find the, the, the cells or the tissue of interest, attach themselves, and then release the drug locally. Nanotechnology also has the potential to revolutionize the way doctors diagnose their patients in the first place using something called a nanoprobe. Taken like a pill, it would move through the body, communicating collected data to the physician. But nanotechnology offers the possibility that we would actually be able to monitor hundreds or even thousands of different molecules simultaneously in our bodies um, with an implanted sensor and, and actually be able to then detect the onset of an infection or a disease long before you even show a symptom. Beyond just diagnosing a patient, miniature robots known as nanobots could also perform microsurgery from inside the body, communicating directly with the surgeon on the outside. Here in the nanorobotics lab at Montreal's École Polytechnique, Sylvain Martel is pioneering research into nanobot technology. We're building robot, miniature robot. Those robots receive instruction from a main computer to do, accomplish various tasks. Everything's computerized. 
So now we can see the surgeon on the computer screen that click about a specific region when they want those you know, microsystem to go and it will go automatically under computer control. Professor Martel is developing technology that will allow him to navigate a fleet of nanosurgeons in a patient's bloodstream, controlled by a computer using infrared communication. We're still on the, uh, on the fundamental research about we can right now propulse those systems in the bloodstream. Uh, we have some uh, problem controlling, but that's just a question of time. Although drug delivery is one possible application of nanotechnology, Professor Martel and others in his field have an even greater vision. Everything is made of atom. Those are the building block of everything. By putting those, uh, those atoms in a specific place, you create molecules, and then you can create new drugs, you can create new material, you can create about anything. This process of reassembling atoms and molecules to create an entirely new material is called nanofabrication. There are going to be applications to human health in uh, a number of areas, the rapid diagnosis of disease, in uh, the discovery of new drugs and therapeutics, all the way to artificial organs and artificial tissues that are used uh, to replace tissues that, have, that are already deteriorated. One other area that's going to be of importance for nanotechnology will be in the area of uh, tissue regeneration. Things like artificial organs or supports that allow the regrowth of, of tissues like bone or nerve cells so that we can actually start to repair things like spinal cord damage uh, are currently under research uh, in a number of places across Canada and the world and really promise to, uh, to deliver real therapies within the next decade or so. So I guess what I could say is that nanotechnology does promise to be revolutionary and to touch almost every aspect of, of, of uh, science and technology today. This new technology may be revolutionary and in its infant stages, but it can't come soon enough for cancer patients like Kurt Chernyshenko. I would most definitely be seeking another alternative way if they said this microscopic way would do it. If the robots would only attack the cancer cells, it would save me so much uh, grief and so much pain because chemo was going in like a kamikaze drug and it's wiping everything out as it's going in, it doesn't distinguish which is good and which is bad, it's just killing everything on the way in. So if the robots are going to kill the one thing, it's going to save me so much more pain. While some may regard it as little more than the product of a creative imagination, Professor Sylvain Martel sees nanotechnology as science fiction about to come true. It's interesting to see those Hollywood uh, movie. Now, it's not 100% true, but there's always uh, in our percentage, which is, makes sense. We might be wrong, but we might be right. So we don't know, this is part of research. The research and creativity that will one day bring nanotechnology out of its infancy is already providing new dimensions to the exploration of the human body. It is called 3D imaging, and it is already moving today's operating room into the world of tomorrow. The Seaman Family Research Center in Calgary, Alberta. Here, a group of researchers and surgeons are merging human with machine to bring a new dimension to the operating room. The brain is the center's main focus, and at the heart of its research is magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI. While MRI is not a new science, what is new here is its use inside the operating room. Once only able to provide a two-dimensional picture of a specific layer of body tissue, it now uses a large, very powerful magnet and radio waves to create detailed cross-sectional images on a computer. Fundamentally, it means producing a volumetric image of an object, or in our case, a human being. We're interested primarily here in the head. So we want to produce a 3D object of the person's head and brain. If you see a series of 2D images, it's hard to tell what's happening out of the imaging plane, what's going on above and below the plane you're currently looking at. But if you stack those images up, 
let the physician rotate the head around on the computer and cut in from the side, all of a sudden they have a new image that wasn't actually acquired. And that's the power. It gives them a whole bunch of new information. Today, specialists are using that information to remove a tumor from the brain of a woman patient. MRI plays a key role in preoperative planning. Well, Nick, can you show me the uh, sagittal images? Center director Dr. Garnet Sutherland is also a neurosurgeon and part of the surgical team that uses the MRI in the OR. The patient was positioned in the planned uh, position for surgery. It was at that time imaging was brought into the operating room. The MR magnet came into the room, went over the patient, and performed our imaging set. We've created, with these MR images, a three-dimensional map of her brain. So we, we are now very knowledgeable of the anatomical structures relative to our pathway that we're about to enter. And this is a cut, what is called a sagittal cut, through the brain and upper spine. And we see the tumor sits right here in front of the structure called the, the spinal cord and the medulla or brain stem. And it's a fairly large tumor and it has displaced the brain stem and the spinal cord backward, uh, severely compressing uh, these structures. For the surgical planning, you have to plan the approach to the tumor, and you need to know what major structures, what bones, what arteries, and what nerves are nearby or could possibly be in the way. And to see that relationship to the mass that you want to remove, you really have to have that 3D imaging. Uh, the patient gets benefit because they get a more uh, complete representation of the anatomy and the physiology and the function that's going on. And it helps uh, physicians because they naturally think in terms of 3D. And if you can show them something in 3D, they get a better feel for how big it is, what its extent is, and what other regions of the brain, for example, that it might be interacting with. While magnetic resonance imaging has been an important diagnostic and preoperative tool, facilities like the Seaman Family Center are starting to take the technology one step further by using it during the operation as well. A lot of the tumors that neurosurgeons approach, the surgeon may be uncertain as to the boundary. And at that time, this machine allows us to stop a little bit earlier than perhaps we would have, take an image, know exactly where that boundary is, and continue to conduct the surgical procedure. In that way, this instrument or these images guide us during the performance of neurosurgery. And I think the reason why I want to go from the left is although the tumor is very midline, it projects a little bit more towards the left. And I think, I think what you've shown us on your image is we got a little bit of tumor uh, surrounding this vertebral artery. So it'll be really important for us to pay attention to that. MRI also comes into play once again before the patient leaves the OR. After the surgical team has gone in there and operated for a couple of hours and said, okay, we've got all the lesion, they'll take a quick quality assurance scan. And up to a third of those cases, there's still significant residual lesion left behind. So then the team goes back in and continues operating before anesthesia is reversed. And that is just such a huge benefit for the patient because otherwise it would mean coming back for another brain surgery or it would mean additional radiotherapy and chemotherapy to try and get that residual tumor. Advancements in MRI technology being used today will definitely have an impact in the operating room of the future. Research is already being done that one day we'll see MRI and robotic technology working side by side in the OR. During an operation, MRI scans will be the X-ray eyes of surgeons operating with robotic extensions of their own skilled hands. If we think about uh, what's happening in neurosurgery, over the past um, one to two decades, there has been a progressive movement of imaging technologies into operating rooms around the world. Uh, while this technology gets refined, it is our belief that this will become a, a standard of care in most centers performing complex procedures. Because we have created an imaging environment, and that imaging environment is in three dimensions, and we can interlay into the image 
um, critical structures that need to be avoided during surgery on the brain. We are now opportune for the development and movement of robotics technology into our operating room. So if you ask me about the future, in the future, surgeons will operate within the image and they will use a robotic system to do that. Outside the operating room, the future looks just as bright. MRI scanning promises to be a valuable tool in predicting brain atrophy and Alzheimer's disease by identifying subtle changes in the structure of the brain. It could also be used in the diagnosis and treatment of certain brain cancers. Combining this kind of powerful imaging technology with new advances in genetics will allow us to specifically tag certain molecules that are expressed by cells in the patient's brain. And we'll be able to image and say, well, this kind of tumor is expressing these kinds of proteins, and therefore it's this kind of tumor, and therefore this kind of treatment will work. That's where we're going in 20, 25, 30 years. Magnetic resonance imaging will also help physicians monitor brain function and activity to achieve a better understanding of the needs of patients recovering from a stroke. It's hard right now to tell what part of the brain is going to live and what's going to die, and that can be critical for the neurologist trying to decide whether or not they should undergo a dangerous treatment. They have to balance the risk to the patient versus the possible benefit, and if they don't know what's at stake, it's hard to make that assessment. So we're using 3D imaging right now and a lot of sophisticated computer algorithms, artificial intelligence type techniques, machine learning, pattern recognition, all that kind of stuff to try and predict what part of the brain is going to live and what part of the brain is going to die. I think uh, one of the most interesting things in um, the whole image guided therapy We'll be tying uh, imaging through with, with uh, novel treatments customized to the patient. We want to gather everything we can about the patient when they come into the clinic and follow them through their whole course of, of treatment. So that if somebody comes back later, say five years later, and they have a similar type of disease, can we learn from what happened before and customize the treatment to the new patient? While 3D imaging promises to take us to the inner reaches of the human body, it can also help us visualize our outer selves as well. We envision that in five years from now, and maybe even less, women and men will be able to go into a plastic surgery clinic and see what they would look like after the operation. Virtual reality is becoming more real all the time. Developments in 3D technology are bringing amazing advancements to video gaming and the movies. One leading provider of optical 3D digitizers and modeling software is InSpec, a company based in Montreal. They have set their sights on bringing the innovation of virtual reality to the world of medicine, particularly in the area of reconstructive surgery. It comes at a time when breast cancer is the number one cause of death among women between the ages of 35 and 50. Although mastectomies help save countless lives, the surgical reconstruction that follows often faces a difficult problem, restoring symmetry to the patient's existing anatomy. Fortunately, 3D technology is promising solutions to both plastic surgeons and breast surgery patients in the form of InSpec's BFD-1300. BFD-1300 is a specially designed 3D digitizing system for application of plastic surgery. BFD stands for breast and face digitizing. When we talk about the medical imaging, like CT scanning, MRI, the PET scan, ultrasonic imaging, the most of those techniques are for the you know, interior structure of the human body, but the digital imaging takes the image of the outside of the body. Dr. Mario Bernier is one of the few plastic surgeons in the world involved in testing a prototype of the BFD-1300. Here, he consults with a patient interested in breast augmentation. Before he performs the procedure, Dr. Bernier wants to be certain that the implant will be perfectly symmetrical with the other breast. Until recently, the only option available to patients 
was to try implants on for size. Every day my patient was asking me, is it possible to see on the computer how my breast can look? And I was always saying to my patient, this doesn't exist, and the patients are very demanding about technology. When the patient comes to see the surgeon for the initial consultation, the surgeon is able to digitize the patient and show her at that initial stage what she would look like after the operation. This gives the patient peace of mind, if you will, and gives her an increased confidence in the procedure she's about to undertake. In the case of a mastectomy, the patient can be scanned, the data can be stored and used at a later date to reconstruct the patient's breast to look like the other breast. The software has a symmetry tool which can scan one breast and reproduce it on the other side to have two identical breasts. This is a great opportunity to see uh, what is going to be the result because uh, you imagine in your head and you think and you take pictures and or do the, the thing with the bra in the mirror but to see on the computer the result under the muscle and under the, the skin it's better. Yeah, it's very great. In the case of facial cosmetic surgery if a patient would like to change the appearance of his or her nose the surgeon can digitize that patient sculpt it virtually on the computer in front of that patient and then show the results. 3D imaging technology has also opened up a new direction in studying scoliosis, which affects nearly 4% of the population. Until now, doctors have depended on X-ray machines to examine spinal deformities. But X-rays are only two-dimensional and can be harmful to human health. Unlike 3D imaging, which uses the same halogen light found in a camera flash. Farida Chariet is part of a team of computer engineers developing 3D imaging technology for scoliosis. With x-rays you have radiations and you, it is dangerous to take a lot of x-rays uh, so frequently but with this system if you want you can get each day a photo it isn't a problem. You just need four cameras around the patient, and it is really very quick. This non-invasive technology allows clinicians to generate an exact visual model of a patient's external spinal structure. But one goal is to perfect the system so that it can actually simulate a patient's internal structure. I think that uh, in the future, we, we can get uh, more information and uh, good visualization of the shape of the patient uh, by combining the external and the internal uh, structures. Because with this system, we can get the 3D reconstruction of the, the bone structure, and this will really help us to predict treatment and uh, uh, take good decisions uh, in the beginning and not waiting until the deformity is really complex. In future years with this research developing, uh, uh, we will be able at some point just to, to, to make decisions uh, on the treatment of uh, children and adolescents just based on these uh, uh, 3D surface mappings, as opposed to what we're doing now where we do have to take x-rays for every decision we want to make. We envision that in five years from now, and maybe even less, women and men will be able to go into a plastic surgery clinic, get digitized, have their models ready, and see what they would look like after the operation. And of various other applications, such as wound and skin care, dermatology, form-fitting braces for amputations due to diabetes, for example. That's an example that we'll, be, we'll see in a few years. Medical science continues to prove that the symbiotic relationship between humans and machines will not only continue, it will be vital to the future successes of our species. Yesterday's science fiction will indeed become tomorrow's science fact. For the first time, I believe, we now have an understanding of science that will not only affect an individual or perhaps a, a single population like a, a, a nation, or a, 
but rather the science that we're discovering now is going to fundamentally change what it means to be a human. Within a hundred years from now, there may be a new species. It, you, homo, homo sapiens may no longer be the number one species on this planet. We may evolve or we may direct our own evolution to go beyond human limitations to do things that we thought were completely impossible. Uh, whether it be a combination of man with machines, with, with inter, uh, brain chip interfaces and so forth, uh, with extended limbs, uh, or do things with our natural organs that were well beyond anything that humans normally have. We are now at a tipping point where science can take such a revolutionary change in such a short period of time.